Last three weeks tonight is the third week. Robbie came out last week and he talked to you about some of the purposes of the Bible. Uh, and then I got to come out to you the week before and talk to you about some basic Bible 101 stuff, some real basic Bible information. Basically, this whole series over the next, uh, well, tonight and then two weeks after tonight, we are going to be talking about the Bible. And so if you take out your little tin cards or bulletins or outlines, whatever we call those things, you will see that the title of tonight's message is the Old Testament. Everyone say the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about a huge chunk of the Bible known as the Old Testament. And so before we get into anything else tonight, I just want to go ahead and uh, answer this question. Um, a lot of people think that the Old Testament isn't relevant anymore. They think that, that we don't need to use the Old Testament, that they don't even really know why it's, it's in our Bibles. And if you don't know, uh, the Old Testament tells the story of the nation of Israel and the people of Israel and their relationship with God. And the New Testament tells the story of Jesus and the life of Jesus and the church and that stuff. And so a lot of people think that we don't really need the Old Testament. We don't need to pay attention to the Old Testament. So they don't think it's relevant. They think it's obsolete. It's gone. We don't need to pay attention to it. Uh, but it's interesting to note that almost every single book in the Old Testament, with the exception of about three or four, almost every single book in the Old Testament is actually quoted in the New Testament. And so the Old Testament is all throughout the New Testament. Um, and you'll see as we go throughout this message, you'll see how the Old Testament can apply to our lives and how we can use it to learn and grow. Um, and how it's actually the story of Jesus. And we'll talk about that as we go through this. Uh, and so I ran into a few problems when, when preparing for this message. Um, first off, there is so much that I want to say about the Old Testament. There's so many great stories, like the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho, the story of David and Goliath, all these great stories in the Old Testament that I wanted to kind of throw all in here, but um, I really just didn't have the time. And so as I was thinking about this, uh, this is what I decided to do, and this is how this message is going to work tonight. Tonight, you've got to put on your imagination caps. Everyone put on your imagination cap. Let me see you put on your imagination cap. If you're too cool for an imagination cap, you're not going to learn anything during this message, so you might as well go ahead and put on that imagination cap. Because tonight, we are going to take a journey through the Old Testament. I'm going to walk you through all 39 books of the Old Testament, and we are going to stop at three different places. And we're going to look at three different themes or three different ideas that can be found as we read through the Old Testament. So to go ahead and kick things off tonight, I want to go ahead and give you point number one in your outline, which is this. This is the very first theme that we're going to come across as we read through the Old Testament. Number one, Israel's covenant with God. Israel's covenant with God. We're going to talk about Israel's covenant with God. Now, if you don't know what a covenant is, um, a covenant is basically just another word for a deal or an agreement. Um, but it's different from a simple agreement in that when you make a covenant with someone... In order for that covenant to last, both people in the covenant have to stick to their end of the deal or their end of the agreement. So let me give you an example. Let's say that I make a covenant with Ricky. And uh, my covenant with Ricky is that my side of the covenant is that every week I'm going to clean his house. Every week I'm going to clean his house, including his dog who eats all of the money in the house. I'm going to clean his house every single week. And in exchange for cleaning his house, this is Ricky's side of the covenant. Ricky's side is that he has to give me his back hair every single week, which is back hair can heal diseases and things like that, so that's why I want that. But um, So I clean Ricky's house, Ricky gives me his back hair, that's our covenant, that's our deal, that's our agreement. But let's say that one week, let's say one week I decide that I'm not going to clean Ricky's house. I'm going to break my end of the covenant. Well, Ricky's not going to give me his back hair for that week because I didn't keep my end of the covenant, and so the whole covenant just falls apart. But let's say one week Ricky decides that he's not going to give me his back hair, even though I cleaned his house. She just came in. She probably has no idea what she's like, back hair. I don't even know what I'm saying. Anyway, so let's say that Ricky, Ricky decides not to give me his back hair, even though I cleaned his house. Ricky breaks his end of the covenant, so I'm not going to clean his house anymore. And so the whole covenant ends up falling apart. And so you can see how both sides have to stick to their end of the covenant in order for the covenant to last. And that will be important as we continue to read through the Old Testament. And so you start off in your journey through the Old Testament, you're going through, you start off in the book of Genesis, and you read about the creation of the world and how God created everything, and then you get to the book of Exodus, and you start reading through the book of Exodus, you read about these people named the Israelites, and God chooses the Israelites to make them his holy people. The Israelites are slaves. They're slaves in Egypt, and they've been there for 400 years. People say the Egyptians built the pyramids. It was actually the Israelites who built the pyramids while they were slaves in Egypt. And so God picks the Israelites and he says, Israelites, I'm going to guide you out of slavery in Egypt. I'm going to guide you through the desert and I'm going to, I'm going to put you in a land that I'm promising you. 
Let's call it the promised land. And so you start to read through the Old Testament and you read about the Israelites as they're going on this journey through the desert. And you start to get to the last half of the book of Exodus and you start to read about all these weird things that God starts telling the Israelites. God begins to give the Israelites this law. And it's called the Levitical law. Everyone say Levitical law. Levitical. And what the Levitical law is, is it was literally 613 different rules that God gave to the Israelites to lead and guide their lives. And so tonight, you can go home and you can open your Bible and you can turn to the book of Leviticus and you can read the entire Levitical law in your Bible tonight. All 613 laws, you can read every single one of them. You probably won't want to, but you could if you decided you wanted to do that. However, you probably already know ten of them. And there are these things known as the Ten Commandments. And what the Ten Commandments are is it's a very small section of the entire Levitical law that consists of some of the most important commandments that God ever gave the Israelites. Two commandments in particular I want to point out. God told the Israelites the very first two commandments he ever gave them were this. First of all, don't worship any other gods. You will worship no other gods before me. And second of all, you will not worship idols. Those are the very first two commandments that God ever gave to the Israelites. And so you continue to read through uh, the Old Testament. You read that the, the Israelites make this covenant with God. And the Israelites say that, okay, God, we are going to obey this law. We're going to obey the Levitical law. And that's their side of the covenant. That's their end of the agreement. And so what was God's side of the covenant? What was his part of the agreement? Well, we read about it in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 28 and verses 1 through 6. It's going to come up on the PowerPoint if you want to look at it there. This is God's side of the agreement. This is Moses, and he's talking to the Israelites, and this is what he says. He says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, in other words, if you stick to the covenant, if you obey the law, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. You ready? Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. And that was the covenant. God said, if you obey the Levitical law, if you stick to all 613 different laws without wavering and you obey them, then I am going to bless you no matter what. It doesn't matter what the economy is like. It doesn't matter what other stuff is going on. It doesn't matter what other nations are coming to power at the time. I am going to bless you. You're always going to have food. You're always going to have money. You're always going to have a place to live. And that was the covenant. That was the covenant. The Israelites obeyed the law, and God blessed them. And so as you continue to read through the Old Testament, you read past Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you get to this book called Joshua. And you read through the book of Joshua, and you start to read about how the Israelites made it through the desert. They made it into the promised land after being in the desert for 40 years. And the Israelites, they're living in the promised land, and everything is going great. They're obeying God's laws. They're obeying the Levitical law. God is blessing them. They have an army that's just undefeatable. Nobody can win. They're conquering all this land. They're living in the promised land. Things are going great. Everything is going awesome. And then something happens. The Israelites... Things started going well for them, the Israelites. And so the Israelites, they did what most of us do, and they began to forget about God because things were going so well in their lives. And slowly but surely, the Israelites began to turn their backs on God, and they began to abandon the covenant that God made with them. And so as we continue to read through the Old Testament, we reach point number two, the second theme that's found in the Old Testament, which is this, number two, Israel's rebellion from the covenant. Israel's rebellion from the covenant. The Israelites started getting comfortable. They started being fine with where they were. They started, they started abandoning the, the, the law that God had given them. They started looking around. They started going, yeah, you know, we've got this whole God thing that we do here. It's kind of just what we've always done. But take a look at this nation over here. And take a look at this nation over here. We, we worship God, but they worship this thing called idols. Take a look at this nation over here. They can see their God. We've never seen our God. We can see the things that he did, but we've never seen our God. And slowly but surely, the Israelites, they turned their backs on God, and they disobeyed the very first two commandments that God ever gave to them, and they began worshiping idols. And the Bible says that it was detestable to God. 
That it literally made God sick. It was repulsive to him to see them worshiping idols. And so I want to talk real quick about two different kinds of idols that the Israelites worshipped. Um, the first kind of idol on your outline is this. Um, they worshipped idols of false gods. The Israelites worshipped idols of false gods. They worshipped huge statues of beings and deities that weren't even real. They worshipped pictures and images. They worshipped visual representations of false gods. Now, this is the most common type of idol that we think about when we think about them worshiping idols. They worship this, this, the idol of this false god named Baal, and an idol of this false god named Molech and Asherah. They worship these idols of false gods. Now, the second kind of idols that they worshiped, and this one might catch you off guard a little bit, they worshiped idols of Yahweh. Idols of Yahweh, and then Y-A-H-W-E-H, Yahweh. Now, if you don't know, Yahweh is just another name for God. Like the one true God, the real God that we worship. They worship images and visual representations of God. Now you say, okay, so what's, what's the big deal with that? You know, they, they thought that they were worshiping God by worshiping these idols. So what was such a big deal about it? Well, remember, God didn't just say don't worship false gods. God said don't worship idols at all. Because it was kind of a slap in the face to God if you think about it. Because here's the deal. You can't use something less glorious to represent something more glorious. The Israelites were trying to use man-made materials like wood and stone to represent the divine nature of a supernatural, supreme, and almighty God. It simply can't be done. It was a slap in the face to God for them to think that they could represent his glory through man-made materials. They worship idols of Yahweh. Now here's why it's so important to look at the fact that they worship idols. And here's, here's what I've been leading up to on this point. A lot of people think that idol worship is a problem of the past. That it's something that we don't really struggle with. It's something we don't deal with anymore. But if you were to ask me what the number one problem in most Christians' lives today are, or what, what the number one problem in most Christians' lives today is, I would tell you it's idolatry. Let me explain why. Let's say that a young man gets a job and he's making a certain amount of money at this job. Let's say he's working at Chick-fil-A just because we're in church. Everybody works at Chick-fil-A because it's Christian chicken. You guys didn't think that was funny at all. Anyway, okay, so he's getting a job at Chick-fil-A. Um, he's making a certain amount of money every week. And, and this young man, he goes to church. And so he can choose to do what the Bible commands us to do in both the Old and New Testament. And he can choose to give 10% of his income to the church. It's called a tithe, and the Bible commands us to do it. And so let's say that this young man, he chooses not to give his tithe, and he's committing a sin by doing that. A lot of people will say that the number one problem in most Christians' lives today is, is the fact that they don't tithe. But really, the reason that young man chose not to give his money to the church was not because he had a simple sin issue. It's because he made an idol out of his money. He put his money before God. Let's say that a young man and a young woman get together and they're boyfriend and girlfriend. And they choose that they're not going to wait to get married before they have sex. And they have sex before they get married. And that's a sin. Well, really, the reason they committed that sin is because they were committing idolatry in their relationship. They were making idols of one another. They were putting their relationship with each other before their relationship with God. You see, nobody has a sin issue alone. Behind every sin issue is an idol issue. And so maybe the issues in your life that you think are simple sin issues, maybe it's time to look underneath the surface a little bit and find the thing that you're putting before God that is causing that sin issue. Find the idol behind that. In the Old Testament, part of the reason it exists is to show us how the Israelites overcame their issues of idolatry and the things that they did. And so back to our story of Israel, back to our, our journey through the Old Testament, um, like I said, the Israelites, they abandoned their covenant with God. They turned their backs on the covenant and they started worshiping idols. And so as you continue to read through, you're reading in books like 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and you read about all these horrible things that started happening to the nation of Israel. Because remember, they broke their end of the covenant. And when one person breaks their end of the covenant, the other person can't keep their end either. And so God could not continue to bless the Israelites because they had broken their end of the covenant. 
And you start to read about all these horrible kings that the Israelites had, all these terrible kings who were doing these horrible things. You start to read about how famine was coming into the land and killing all the crops and all the animals and disease was coming in. And, and other nations like the Assyrians and the Babylonians were coming in. They were conquering Israel. And all these horrible, horrible things were happening to the Israelites. And the Israelites do something that amazes me. The same people who turned their backs on God when things were going so well, blamed God when things started falling apart. They began to look at God and say, God, why are you letting this happen to us? Why are you causing all this to happen? When really, they knew it was because they had abandoned their covenant with God. They simply refused to admit that they were a sinful people. And so as we continue to read through the Old Testament, we reach point number three, the third theme that we're going to run into, which is this. Number three, Israel's prophets... And the new covenant. Israel's prophets and the new covenant. As you read past books like Song of Solomon, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and some of the wisdom and poetry and songs that are found in the Old Testament, you start to reach these books known as the major prophets. And the major prophets are, are these prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah. And what a prophet did is a prophet simply delivered God's message to the people of Israel. And sometimes this message involved looking at the past. Sometimes this message involved uh, dissecting and analyzing the present. Sometimes this message involved predicting the future. And so you start to read about all these major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And you start to look at some of the lesser known prophets. And you read through books like Haggai and Joel and, and Zechariah. And finally you reach the final book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi. And you read through the book of Malachi and then it hits you. Then all the prophets, from the very first prophet Isaiah to the final prophet in the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, they all had one idea in mind. They all had one message, and that was this. Israel's redemption. Israel's redemption. You see, God did not want the Israelites to die. He did not want the Israelites to go through the pain and the suffering that they were going through. He didn't want the Israelites to break the law. He didn't want them to break the covenant. And so he sent the prophets to predict a day where there would be no more breaking of the law. There would be no more broken covenant because the prophets were going to predict a day where there would be a new covenant, a different covenant. We read about this covenant uh, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and verses 31 through 33 on your outline. It says this. It says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. I want you to underline that phrase, new covenant. I will make a new covenant, a different covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant. Uh, underline that phrase again, new covenant. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Here's what God was saying in these verses. In these verses, it is a beautiful passage of Scripture that wraps up the entire Old Testament and connects it to the New Testament. This is what God was saying in these verses right here. He was saying, you've got the Old, the old Covenant. You've got the Levitical law that you were supposed to follow. The law where you, you obeyed the law, you obeyed all 613 different commandments, and you got blessed. You got that covenant, but you broke that covenant. You destroyed that covenant. Though I loved you as a husband loves his wife, you broke that covenant. But there's going to come a day where I'm going to send someone who's going to make a new covenant. I'm going to send someone, let's call him the Messiah. Let's call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Let's call him Jesus. And Jesus is going to come, and he's going to live a perfect, spotless life. He's going to do every single thing that the law commands to do. He's going to stick to all 613 different commandments. He is going to fulfill the tasks of the law. He is going to fulfill the law. And when he does, there would be no need for the old covenant anymore because Jesus will be the example that you're supposed to follow. You see... God knew that the Israelites weren't going to be able to stick to the law. He knew that they weren't going to be able to live it out perfectly because they were a sinful people. So why did he even give them the law in the first place? Did he give it to them and then change his mind when he realized it wasn't going to work out? No. He had to give them the law to show them a standard of perfection. 
To show them how sinful they were. If he hadn't given them the law to say that when you reach this point, when you obey all 613 different commandments, then you're perfect. If he hadn't done that, they wouldn't know what's right and what's wrong. He gave them the law to show them the standard of perfection. And then when the time was right, he sent Jesus. And Jesus achieved that standard of perfection. And now because Jesus achieved it, we don't follow the old law anymore. We don't follow the old covenant anymore. Now we follow the new covenant. Because now it's not about the laws that you follow. Now it's about the person that you follow. Now it's not about the rules anymore. The 613 different rules. Now it's about having a relationship with Jesus. You see, the law was never meant to last forever. The law was simply supposed to be the forerunner to Jesus. It was supposed to be the thing that came before. It was supposed to be the predecessor. It was supposed to be the thing that set the stage for Jesus to come on the scene and change everything. Which really means that the law was just about Jesus. And if the law was just about Jesus, that means that the prophets were really just about Jesus. And if the prophets were about Jesus, then the Israelites were about Jesus. And if they were about Jesus, then really the whole Old Testament was just about Jesus. Which means that the whole Bible is simply just a book about Jesus. See, tonight I want to give you your walkaway point. Before I do, I want to kind of set it up like this. And I'm going to say this, and this is not the point, so don't fill it in yet. God had a plan from the beginning. And it involved the prophets, it involved the Israelites, it involved the law, and it involved all these different covenants. God had a plan from the beginning, but his plan didn't stop at the end of the Old Testament. It didn't stop at the end of the New Testament. God had a plan from the beginning, your walkaway point, and it involves me. God had a plan from the beginning, and it involves me. And so my question to you tonight is this. Which covenant are you following? Which covenant are you following? Are you following the covenant where it's about the rules? It's about the things that you feel like you have to do in order to be a good Christian? Or are you following the covenant where you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Where he is the example that you follow. Where you have a deep relationship with him. Where you talk to him. And you hear from him. And he changes the way that you think. He changes the way that you talk. He changes the way that you look at other people. Which covenant are you following? Do you have a relationship with with Jesus. If you don't, you can start one tonight. Maybe tonight your issue is not that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe tonight there's an idol issue in your life. Maybe tonight you realize that the thing you thought was a simple sin issue has now become an idol issue and you've got to get rid of that idol. I encourage you, if that's you, to come down and pray and ask Jesus, Jesus, show me the idol in my life. Show me the thing that I need to get rid of. Show me the thing that I need to work on if you've got an idol issue. Maybe tonight you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you just need to come down and pray and ask Him to be your Savior, ask Him to be your leader. Maybe tonight is something else that you're struggling with. I don't know what we're struggling with in the room tonight, but Jesus can help you. And so in just a minute, I'm going to pray. And if you fall into any of those categories, if there's something that you need prayer for, we'll be willing to pray, pray for you and help you if you just come down and pray as the band starts to play. So if you bow your head and close your eyes, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, tonight you know that I've done my best to communicate the truth to these students, God, to give them your word, to give them your wisdom and the message that you've laid on my heart, God. I ask that it would not be in vain, God. I ask that your word would be fruitful, God, that it would produce fruit and that lives would be changed tonight, God, that hearts would be changed, that idols would be crushed and destroyed, that relationships with you would be built or relationships with you would be reestablished if there are those who have been away tonight, God. Pray for all those tonight who are thinking about coming down but don't want to make the decision. I pray that you would soften their heart to know that they just need to talk to you. They just need somebody to pray over them and they would believe in the power of prayer, God. We love you so much and I thank you for the things that are about to happen in this room tonight. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you guys would come on down.